Judging Forms by Their Labels, presented by Alicia Evans, Alley Camp, 2021. We'd like to thank our gold sponsors Telstra and Intopia, our silver sponsors ANZ and Coles, and our bronze sponsor How To. Hello friends, welcome to Judging Forms by Their Labels. I hope you're all enjoying Alley Camp 2021. Hi, uh, my name is Alicia Evans, and I'm an accessibility consultant at Nobility. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I'm currently located in Southern California in the United States. I have included a photograph of myself uh, with my dad's standard poodle, who is off-white, very large, um, and in our background, we're surrounded by beautiful pink and yellow roses. Um, I am a woman in my early 30s. Some might say mid thirties <laughs> and I have long, dark hair. I'm wearing black framed glasses uh, and I have very fair skin. So today we're going to talk about how to make accessible labels. And here is our agenda for this talk. So first we're going to talk about labels in general. So a brief introduction of labels. Next we'll cover why labels need to be visible, clear and persistent. And then we'll move on to how to programmatically define labels and why that's important for assistive technology users. Then we'll discuss how to group fields, group related fields and field sets. Um, and then we'll touch on ARIA and CSS solutions. Everything above this is purely HTML. So for ARIA, we'll cover ARIA label, ARIA labeled by and ARIA described by, which are all attributes. And then for CSS, we'll cover a visually hidden class. So the term label can be pretty broad. Uh, so for this talk, we're specifically going to cover label elements, other elements masquerading as label elements, placeholders, legends for field sets used as a label for a group of inputs, um, and how to name buttons. So that's the very narrow range of what we'll be covering for labels, but it should give a broad idea. So before we can talk about why it's important to have accessible labels, we have to talk about why labels are important in general. Um, so here on the screen, I have a very extreme example of five inputs with no labels whatsoever. And if I were on a page and I came to this pretty ridiculous form, um, I would have trouble knowing what information was expected of me. Um, it's possible that through context, I could figure out, oh, this is a shipping address. I'm going to assume that the first input is my first name and the second is my last name maybe, and three address fields and try to work it out from there. But in general, I think that most people would have a really difficult time filling out a form if there were no labels whatsoever. Uh, and while I never see such an extreme example on the web, I do see variations of this kind of all over the place. Almost every form I go to on the web has some sort of accessibility issue. Um, and that does sound pretty extreme, <laughs> but it's always so shocking to me how inaccessible forms are. So today we're going to go through the different ways that forms can be accessible and what we can do to fix them. So the first thing is, what seems to be the most obvious, that labels must be visible. In the previous example, there were no labels at all, and it was very hard to know what should I fill in to this form. For this example, I have three input fields and one thing to label all of them, and that's the word date. Uh, so if I came to something like this that said date and had three input fields, I might think maybe the first one's month, maybe the second one's day, maybe the last one is year. But depending on who you are, where you come from, maybe date comes first, maybe the day comes first and month comes second. Um, maybe the year is the most important part and that's what they want first. And there's just no way to know without submitting this form and seeing what the errors are, which is a pretty bad user experience all in all and is pretty inaccessible. So this is something that I've seen on the web is having one label for multiple fields and assuming that the user will figure out what's expected of them. This isn't good practice, it's not a good user experience, and it's inaccessible. 
The next thing that we're going to look at is that labels must be clear. So in this example, there are two input fields. Each one of them does have a label, but the labels are the same. So the first input is asking for name, and the second input is also asking for name. And if I came to this field, I would assume that I put my um, given name first, my family name second. But if I were filling this form out in another part of the world, I might assume that family name came first and that given name came second. And it's also possible that that's not what they mean at all, that what they mean is we need your legal name first and we need your nickname second or we need your maiden name second. So never assume when you're putting together a form that people understand exactly what you need. Make sure your labels are clear. Make sure that they're saying exactly what they're asking for. And again, this is an example that you might not see as much out on the web, but there are lots of examples out there of labels that aren't clear and it's not clear what it is that they're asking for. The next thing we're going to look at is that labels must persist. And with that, I've added placeholders won't cut it. Um, so I've seen lots of companies that think that placeholders do the job. And for a lot of people, they do. Um, they say what the field is for, and they're usually pretty clear um, about what the label is for. So there's a, a labeling element and there's clarity, which cover the first two things that we looked at. But the problem with labels, okay, there are many problems <laughs> with, with placeholders um, uses labels, but one of the big problems is that they don't persist. So in this example, I have a form that says contact information has two fields and a submit button. And the second field says email in the placeholder text. And the first field has the letter A, which doesn't make any sense. Um, the reason the letter A is in there is because I've already started to fill this out. If I delete the A, then it says name in the placeholder, which is a very helpful label. But if I come to this form and I have short-term memory loss, then I might not remember that name was what the label for this field was. Um, if I started filling out this form and then went to chase my two-year-old around the house, I might come back and need to start over and not realize what this was for. Um, if I just have a headache today and I'm having trouble focusing, then I really would like there to be a persistent label so I don't need to focus as completely on something as simple as filling out this form. Um, and you might think, just delete it and start over. You, you know, it's not that big of a deal. But if I have pain in my hands, for example, if I have um, tremors or other forms of loss of fine motor control, it's going to be a lot more difficult for all of these little interactions, all these keyboard strokes. So it's very important to make sure that your labels persist. On top of that, there are lots of other problems with placeholder text. One thing is that they very often have low contrast. The colors used are usually gray on some sort of white background. And this can be very difficult to perceive for people with low vision um, to combat that, to, to address that. Some designers and developers will just increase the text contrast, um, which does pass color contrast and makes it a lot easier to see. But the problem with that is that then the form already looks filled in. So if it looks like name and email are already filled in in this form, then I'm not going to fill it in or I might forget that, oh, I still need to fill this part in. It makes it harder to scan the form and see what needs to be addressed. So now we've discussed some of the important aspects of visual labeling, but that's not the whole story. Labels must also be programmatically defined so that assistive technology users get the full benefit of those labels. And before we move on, I do want to say that all of these slides are available online. They should be available with the resources for this course, but just in case, you can find them at nobility.github.io slash presentations slash alley camp with the dash between slash judging dash forms dot html.
Before we talk about how to programmatically associate labels and inputs, we need to have a baseline understanding of the accessible name. So what is an accessible name? There's a lot of information online about the accessible name, and I found a lot of it very, very confusing. So I've tried to distill it down into the core concept here for you. So the accessible name is the name that assistive technologies communicate to users to identify an element. And there is a link here to the accessible name computation. And if you visit the slides, you can quickly click on that link and read more about it. Um, it is a lot more complicated <laughs> than this explanation. Um, but basically how it works on the web is a developer writes some code. That code is interpreted by the browser and rendered for the user. Um, the operating system or the OS takes information from the browser and uses the accessibility API to communicate that to assistive technologies. And then assistive technologies communicate that information to the user. So all of the accessibility information goes through each step from the code to the browser to the operating system through the accessibility API to assistive technologies and then to the user, which is quite a long way for it to travel. But what I want you to understand is that if that accessibility information is not in the code itself, then it won't magically travel through those other steps to the user. Um, there are a lot of ways that accessibility is baked into code. So if there is semantic HTML that's used correctly, then a lot of that accessibility information you get for free. But if not, you need to add it yourself. So let's look at an example of this. Here we have labels that aren't programmatically defined. And in this case, it's just an example with one label. That's OK. <laughs> um, so here's an input with a visual label of favorite animal. The favorite animal label, however, is just a paragraph element, a p tag or p element. Um, there's nothing that programmatically associates the text favorite animal with this input. So for a visual user, this is checking off all of the boxes. It has a label. The label is clear. This is clearly asking me for my favorite animal. And it's persistent. It doesn't disappear when I start typing into the input. But for a user of assistive technology, this isn't going to cut it. Um, if I'm a screen reader user and I'm tabbing through a form, I'm not reading through all the labels first. I'm relying on this input to have all the information that it needs and convey that to me through the process we saw before. So now I wanna show you how you can check on the accessible name and find out what it is and make sure that each element has one. So I'm going to use the Google Chrome developer tools for this, but you can do the same thing on Firefox or any other browser. Um, I'm just going to show you in Chrome. That's what I have open, okay. All right, so once you're in Chrome, what you wanna do is open the inspector. Um, if you're a mouse user, you can do that by right-clicking and choosing Inspect. If you're a keyboard user, you can open this by clicking Control-Shift-C or Command-Shift-C. Once you're in the inspector, highlight the element you want to look into. In this case, it's the input. And then get to the accessibility pane. Um, there is a tab in Chrome Developer Tools for accessibility. And once I open that, my accessibility pane is open. So the top section is the accessibility tree. And within that, I can go down to my input and see that it is a text box. But there's no name next to this text box, which is what I would expect to see if this had an accessible name. If I scroll down to the name section, it shows me that name is empty. So this is a text box with no accessible name. Within this name section, I can see the different possibilities for naming this element. There's are you labeled by, which is not specified. Are you label, not specified. From label, not specified. This would be the HTML label. Placeholder, not specified. Are you placeholder, not specified. And title, not specified. Any of these will provide an accessible name, but none of these are filled out. They're also listed in order. 
So we can see here that the ARIA labeled by has the highest priority, followed by ARIA label, followed by label, followed by placeholder, followed by ARIA placeholder, and followed by title. Um, if we had both a label and an ARIA label, for example, which we will talk about later on in this discussion, the ARIA label would provide the accessible name and the label wouldn't be announced at all. So that's something very important to keep in mind here. Okay, now I want to show you the same thing only using a screen reader. So we'll see what the screen reader announces when it reaches this field. And to do that, I'm going to open the same slide deck in Safari because I'm on a Mac computer, which already comes with the voiceover screen reader and the voiceover screen reader works best with Safari, not Chrome. So now I'll open the same slide up in Safari and try out my screen reader. Okay, so now I'm in Safari and I'm going to open the voiceover screen reader so that we can read through this page and see what happens when we reach the favorite animal input. What I'm expecting is that because there's no accessible name, this won't be announced as anything specific, but rather something more generic. So let's see what happens. First, I'll turn on my screen reader. Voice over on Safari, judging forms by their labels, A111. And if you press control, that will pause the voice. So pro tip, um, let's get into this. Thing. In judging forms by their labels, A11. And then let's go down to this heading first. Heading level three, labels that aren't programmatically defined. Okay. And down to the label, favorite animal. Favorite animal. You are currently on a text element. Okay, so that was announced as favorite animal, but it was only announced as a text element. There's nothing in there that says this is associated in any way with an input field. Okay, so let's go down into the input and see what's announced there. Edit text blank. You are currently on a text. All right, so it announced edit text blank. Voice over off. If you were a screen reader user and you were trying to fill out a very long form, using the tab key, this would just be announced as edit text, edit text, edit text, edit text. And that doesn't provide enough valuable information to be able to fill out this form. Instead, you'd have to look around the field trying to find associated text or read from top to bottom. And even that isn't 100%. There could be a lot of text on the page and it might be difficult to know which label is associated with which input especially if you don't know if the label is above the input or below the input. Okay, so I'm going to go back to Chrome and we're going to look at another example. Okay, so now we're back in Chrome and we're here with a new example, labels that are programmatically defined. In this case, I've used the same exact example, an input with favorite animal, but I've changed the code to make sure that this is programmatically defined. I've been working in this field for a few years now, and I've been so shocked at how many developers I meet, some of them with over 20 years experience, who don't know how to programmatically associate a, a label with a field. Um, and if that's you, don't worry, I'm going to show you right now how it's done. So in this case, we have favorite animal in a label element. And below that we have the input for favorite animal. But even just having a label element itself isn't enough to programmatically associate these two elements. What you need to do is give the input a unique ID value. In this case, I've added ID equals fave animal. And then for the label, add a for attribute and give it the same value. So here there's the, there's the label with for equals fave animal. And below that is the input with an ID of fave animal. And that will programmatically link the two. So now let's take a look at our inspector and see if it has an accessible name. Okay, so now I'm in Chrome. I need to open my inspector either with a right click or with Control Shift C or Command Shift C. And I'm once again on this input, which is highlighted for favorite animal. And if I get into my accessibility pane by clicking the accessibility tab, now text box has favorite animal in quotes beside it. So that's the name of this input field now. And if we go a little bit farther down in the name section, next to name, it says favorite animal, which is the accessible name for this field. 
And it still says ARIA labeled by not specified, ARIA label not specified, and below that from label through the for attribute. Uh, and then it has favorite animal, but it's a little bit truncated here. But now we know that this does have an accessible name. So let's go one more time into Safari and check this out with our screen reader. So now we're on the same slide again, but this time in Safari, and we're going to use the voiceover screen reader to see what is announced now when we go down to the input. So first I'll turn on my screen reader. Voiceover on Safari, judging forms by their labels, a 11 y camp 2000. Okay, let's go down into the page. In judging forms by their labels, heading level three, labels that are programmatically defined. That was our heading. Now we'll go down to the label. Favorite animal. You are currently on a tab. Okay, same as it was. Um, but now let's go into the input and see what's announced. Favorite animal, edit text. Okay, great. So now when I get to this input, it's announced as favorite animal edit text. And if this were a huge form full of lots of different inputs and I were a screen reader going through by tabbing or through forms mode, I would have a really good idea of what each input was requesting of me. Voice over off. Okay. So now let's go back to Chrome. Okay. So now you've seen how labels can be programmatically defined to give inputs an accessible name. But what about if you have groups of related fields? In that case, use a field set. So here I have two field sets, one that says choose one gift and has three radio buttons, coffee mug, t-shirt, and Rubik's cube. These are all gifts that we've given away at Nobility in the past. The next field set says extras, and it has three checkboxes, card, gift wrap, and singing telegram. If these were all in isolation, coffee mug, t-shirt, Rubik's cube as radio buttons, and then card, gift wrap, and singing telegram as checkboxes, it wouldn't be as clear what was, asked, what was being asked for in this situation. But because we use a field set with a legend, it's clear to visual users and to screen reader users the context of these fields. Here's some more examples. So let's say in our situation where you're choosing a gift and some extras for somebody, that there's also a request for information from the giver and the receiver. Here I have a field set for giver and a field set for receiver that both have name and email inputs in them. If you took away the giver and receiver field sets and legends, this would just be name, email, name, email, which doesn't make a lot of sense to anyone. And if these were just headings, it wouldn't have the same context for screen reader users. So the way to solve for this is to use field sets for related fields and give them a legend that explains the association. Okay, and I've provided some code here for you. And again, these slides are all available. So if you wanna go and inspect the code yourself on the given slides, you can. Um, so in this code, we have a field set element and we put a legend element as the first child. So the legend here is giver. Then we have two inputs and each input has its own label. So even though there's a field set, the label is still important for each individual field. All right, so that's the end of our HTML segment. Now we're going to be exploring ARIA. And ARIA stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications. And here I've included an illustration of Merlin the wizard casting a spell over the sword and the stone. And the reason for that is that people often think of Arya as magic. Either it's too complex and they're afraid to touch it, <laughs> which I totally understand. Um, or they think of it as this cure-all that just by sprinkling some Arya, everything is going to be magically accessible. Um, and hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll have a better understanding of what Arya is, when you should use it, and kind of more importantly, when you shouldn't use it. <laughs> um, the first rule of ARIA is don't use ARIA unless you have to. So if there is an HTML solution, like we've seen already by having a programmatically associated label element, then use that. Don't run to ARIA. But there are some cases where ARIA is the only solution, and then you have to use it, and definitely do use it. 
All right. So let's start with what is ARIA. And this is a quote from the W3C. Way ARIA, W-A-I-A-R-I-A, the Accessible Rich Internet Application Suite, defines a way to make web content and web applications more accessible to people with disabilities. It especially helps with dynamic content and advanced user interface controls developed with HTML, JavaScript, and related technologies. So it's kind of a mouthful, um, but there are big two big takeaways here. One is that ARIA is only one way to make things more accessible. As we've seen, there are HTML solutions, and as we'll see later, there are also CSS solutions. So ARIA is not the one thing to, to reach for, for your accessibility needs. Uh, if it were an infomercial, it would be a reverse infomercial, not your one solution to everything. Um, and the other part is that it's designed to be very helpful with very advanced content. Um, there is no HTML solution for uh, an accordion, for example, for letting users know that things are expanding and collapsing. You need ARIA for that, but you don't need ARIA for everything. And to illustrate that, I have here a regular HTML button made with um, the button elements. And that's just button type equals button with the text button. It's very simple. Um, and then I have what a lot of developers try to do, which is an ARIA button um, that's made from a div. Uh, sometimes I see them made out of links, but a button is a button. You should not use a link for it. Um, the main differentiator here is that links are used to navigate to something generally. So navigate to another page or navigate within a page, whereas buttons do something. So buttons will open a modal or uh, close a pop-up. They perform an action. So here we have our button, which is in blue, and our ARIA button. Um, and they look pretty similar at first glance. Uh, and what developers will try to do is they'll try to add role equals button, which is a little piece of ARIA that announces to assistive technologies, this isn't a div anymore, it's a button, treat it like a button. But that's all that it does. There are a lot of things that HTML buttons do that are beyond just being announced as buttons. So the first issue that we have with this button is that you can't reach it with a keyboard. You can't reach a div with a keyboard. So you'll have to make an accommodation for that. And in this case, we've added tab index equals zero. Now it's reachable when a user is pressing tab to get to it. But it doesn't need to just be reachable by keyboard. You need to be able to activate it with both the enter key and the space bar. So in addition to having a click listener, you would also need to add a key listener to listen for the keys that should be able to activate this button. The problem with spacebar, though, is that its purpose is to scroll a page. So if you're making sure that your spacebar will activate the button, then you also need to make sure that it doesn't scroll the page. You have to prevent default within your JavaScript. But not only that, you also need to change your cursor to the expected arrow cursor for a button instead of having the text edit cursor. And you would need to, if you're using and if you're using custom focus styles, you'll need to include any element with roll button or tab index equals zero to also have those same focus styles. So there's a lot of extra work that goes into making a button out of a div, when if you just use a button element, you would get all of that stuff for free. And it's not that difficult to style a button. That's the excuse that you hear that it's, oh, it's more difficult to style a button. It takes so little time. And once you do it once, just reuse that code forever, put it in a CSS reset, do what you need to do um, to just do the job once. And then you're done. All of your accessibility needs for buttons are met. So when you need to do a button, please, please, please use a button element. Don't make ARIA buttons anymore. The, the web is riddled with them and there are always problems. Even if you put in all of these things, there might be something that breaks or something that's forgotten and then it's inaccessible again. All right, so now that we've gone through all of our caveats, um, let's start on our first ARIA technique and that's ARIA label. So ARIA label, along with all of these things that we're discussing, um, is one way to provide an accessible name. 
you want to use it when there's no visible text that could be used for a name for the elements. And we'll discuss that a little bit further when we look into ARIA labeled by. Um, a caveat, it doesn't work consistently on all elements. So it doesn't work really on generic elements like divs or spans. It works really well for buttons and links and things that have inherent roles or explicit roles. If you wanted to add a role equals button, it would also work for that. But again, we're not doing that. So inherent roles. And the format for aria label is aria-label equals, and then in quotes, whatever you want the accessible name for the element to be. So let's look at an example, which will hopefully make it a little bit clearer what I mean here. Here's our example. This is a button I stole from the Nobility website because it was just there and accessible already. Um, we have a button with a magnifying glass on it, and this was taken from our search form. So the magnifying glass is an SVG. If it were an image, we could add an alt attribute to that image, and that would stand in as the accessible name for the button as a whole, which is great. Um, but because it's an SVG, it doesn't have that alt value or that alt attribute, and it's a little bit harder to name. What we can do instead is we can add an ARIA label attribute to the button itself and say what we want the accessible name of that button to be. In this case, search is fine. Um, we don't want it to be something descriptive like magnifying glass because that doesn't describe the purpose of the button. We want this to be a search button and to be announced as a search button. So ARIA label equals search works fine. Okay. Next, let's look at ARIA labeled by. You want to use ARIA labeled by to associate visible text with that element. So if there's already visible text on the page that could serve as a name, you would want to use ARIA labeled by instead of ARIA label. The format for this is ARIA dash labeled by with double L's for the second L group equals quote and then space separated ID values. So in this example, I have aria dash labeled by equals quote ID one space ID two space ID three. And this can be a little bit confusing. So that's why examples are so important. Let's look at our aria labeled by example. All right, so in this example, I use the same search button, but it's connected to a search field or it's next to a search field and has a label for that search field that says search. Since we were already going to use search as our accessible name, we might as well use the visible text here. So we have the label search, the input with the ID search that is now programmatically associated with that label, and then the submit button. And we use aria labeled by to link the label search with the button using the ID value. So to do that, we add an ID to the label element and then add an aria labeled by attribute with the same value. So in this case, the ID value for the search label is search dash label and the aria labeled by value for the button is also search dash label. Now these two are programmatically associated. So now we'll go on to ARIA Describe By. ARIA Describe By isn't going to add an accessible name. It's going to add an accessible description. So according to the W3C website, an accessible description provides additional information related to an interface element that complements the accessible name. So it doesn't replace it. It just adds to a user's understanding of this component. ARIA Describe By is one way to provide an accessible description, and the format is ARIA dash Describe By equals, and then just like ARIA Labeled By, it's space separated ID values. So in this case, I have ARIA dash Describe By equals, and then in quotes, ID1 space ID2 space ID3. And like we saw with ARIA Labeled By, it can just be one ID value. It doesn't need to be a long list of them, but if you need, need it to be, it can be which is great, it's versatile. So let's look at an example, which will hopefully make this easier to understand because these can be pretty complex ideas. So in this example, 
I have a password field with a programmatically associated label that says password, and below that, some information about how to fill in this field. In this case, must be at least eight characters. And this is the same problem we had with labels, where if you're a screen reader user tabbing through the fields, you'll never reach this instruction that the password must be at least eight characters. And even if you did read from top to bottom, you would reach must be at least eight characters after filling in this input, presumably. So the way to fix this is to programmatically associate the description with the input. And this should be pretty familiar because that's also what we needed to do with the label. So just having the instructions as text below the field does not programmatically associate it. We'll use aria described by to programmatically associate it. And this works largely the same way as aria labeled by, where we'll add an ID value to what we want to be associated programmatically. In this case, we have a small element with must be at least eight characters in it. And I've added the ID value PW-REX, R-E-Q-S, so password requirements. Um, and then on the input itself, I've added an ARIA described by attribute with that same value, PW-REQS. Now, if I also had an error message on this password, field, then I could also add that error message below the password field and associate that using the same aria described by attribute. I would just add an ID value to whatever element held the error message and then change my aria described by value by adding a space and then the ID value of the error message. So it could be aria dash described by equals pw dash rex space error message or whatever the ID value of my error message would be. So that's a way that you can have multiple descriptions and use that space separated value for either ARIA labeled by or ARIA described by. And this is another one that I think we should take a look at in our Chrome developer tools to see how this accessible description is attributed. So if I'm in Chrome, I open my inspector either by right clicking and choosing inspect or by choosing control shift C or command shift C. And now I have my input highlighted. And if I go to my accessibility pane by clicking the accessibility tab, I still just see a text box with the name password next to it. Um, there's some ARIA attributes that we can look at, but for now we'll go down to the naming field and it says name, password from the label. And then below that there's description must be at least eight characters. So we know that this accessible description is now programmatically defined. Now let's see what happens with the screen reader by opening Safari and using the voiceover screen reader. Now I'm in Safari, so I'm going to turn on my voiceover screen reader. Voiceover on Safari, judging forms by their labels, A11Y. Okay, let's go into the page. In judging forms by their labels. A All right, now let's go to the heading. Heading level four, two items. Are you the ESCRIBEBBY example? You are currently on a heading level four. Okay, now let's get to the label. Password. You All are currently right. on a text. And now let's see what happens when we go to the input itself. Password edit text. Must be at least eight characters. You are currently on a text field. To end. Okay. Voice over off. So what happened was we got to the input and it said password edit text and there was a space or a pause. But after that pause, it announced must be at least eight characters. So the entire instruction and labeling of this field is announced to screen reader users and is recognized by assistive technologies. Now let's go back to Chrome. Okay, so that was ARIA described by. We're back in Chrome now. So let's see what the last technique is. All right, so now we're on to the CSS solution, which is using visually hidden text. So before we get started on what it means to use visually hidden text, I should say that if you're trying to hide content from all users, visual users, and all assistive technology users, then you want to use the CSS display none or visibility hidden. That will hide it from everyone. 
So I've seen this a lot where things are hidden visually, but they're meant to be hidden from everybody and screen reader users end up stuck in long parts of the page that should just be hidden. So use display none or visually hidden when you're trying to hide content from everyone. On the flip side of that, that means that you can't use display none or visibility hidden if you're trying to provide context for screen reader users only. And if you are trying to hide content from everyone, don't rely on opacity or hiding something off screen or clip text because screen reader users will still have access to that as well as other assistive technology users. So how do you provide context through CSS that's still hidden visually? And the answer to that is a visually hidden class or something similar. I've also seen SR only um, and different things like that. And, and that works. Although I think visually hidden is more correct um, because more than just screen reader users can use visually hidden text. There are lots of other assistive technology users who can also access it. Okay, so here's our visually hidden text example. And this one's pretty straightforward because it's our same search button that we've had a ton of other times. So in this instance, we have our search button with its magnifying glass. And then instead of using an ARIA label directly on the button, we've added a span with the class visually hidden with the text search. So now this is the same essentially as having a button with search text within it, just the very basic, simple, accessible button. And I tend to prefer this approach. The only thing is that if people are just learning about visually hidden text, there's this instinct to go overboard and make lots of different things in visually hidden text to give a lot of different context for screen reader users, and it ends up being more harmful than helpful. So Use it with a grain of salt, only use it if it's the best possible solution, which is also what you could say for ARIA. Okay, so that's visually hidden text and I've included the code for you, um, which is courtesy of the Alley project, um, the A11Y project, and the link is available in the slides as is this code. So this is how you put together the CSS for a visually hidden class. It doesn't come for free just by writing it in. You do have to include it in your CSS. Um, and there are quite a few different things involved in this. So I'm not going to read it out loud, but you can visit the Alley project and look for their visually hidden text post or you can just find this link on my slides and it will show you exactly what the code is as provided by the Alley project. And that's it. Thank you so, so much. This has been great. I hope you've learned a lot. Um, if you have questions, please definitely ask me. My email address is Alicia, and that's spelled A-L-I-C-I-A -I -A at nobility.org. And nobility is kind of a tricky one too. It's K-N-O-W. B-I-L-I-T-Y. So that's alicia at nobility.org. Also, um, I'll be presenting again at Access U 2022, and that's in Austin, Texas. That's one of the great things that Nobility does is we have a learning conference every single year. And this year we're doing a hybrid event. So if you can't make it out to Austin, Texas, you can join us virtually, and that would be great. I'd love to see you there. And if you get a moment, check out Nobility. We're a great nonprofit that's been doing accessibility work for over 20 years, and we would love to work with you. All right. Thank you so, so much. Take care, everyone. Bye. Alley Camp 2021.